Welcome to Odin's Alchemy. Odin's Alchemy is brought to you by thecauldron.net, music to feed your soul. Your favorite place for new pagan artists and other resources such as Fringe TV and The Witch's Brew Magazine. Odin's Alchemy is brought to you by Fehu Crafts. Fehu Crafts is a father-daughter company from Poland where their motto, Crafted with Love and Passion, shows in all their fine woodwork. This week from Fehu, we have a new Elder Futhark set. This one's a bit denser than the other one. This one's made of pine, and he's using a real pine resin to seal it, which also smells really nice. And this just has a real nice, dense feeling to it. Also this week from Fehu Crafts, he sent out the other rune designs. So, We've got a neat round one, which Christy likes, a smaller square, and then in a bag, the classic shape that comes in the box with the more rectangular with the hole drilled in them, where you, so you can wear it as a necklace or I like to wear them in my beard, and that one comes with a little leather thong. So those are our products from Fehu Crafts, crafted with love and passion. So this week on Elden's Alchemy, we're going to be starting our alchemy project. We're going to need, for this week, we're going to need your plant material, your grinder, your alcohol, and one of your mason jars. And we're going to go through the actual project itself and then what's happening, what's happening scientifically and also more Gnostically as far as, it, as far as it pertains to the magnum opus. So let's go ahead and start the project and get our body learning the uh, steps of this and start that learning process. And then as that's going on, we'll start mixing in the more knowledge portion of it. For myself, I chose elderberries. We've uh, had a bit of chest colds going around, so we've went through our elderberry and used quite a bit of it, so it's time to make up some elderberry. As far as magically, elderberry is a feminine, which also makes sense with the scientific where the elderberry is grabbing on to the virus and the bug, grabbing onto it and suffocating it. You know, it so that makes a whole lot of sense. Its element is water. Its deities are Holda and Venus. Powers of exorcism, protection, healing, prosperity, and sleep. In ritual uses, the elder was used in burial rites in ancient British long burrows. It is sacred among many mother goddess figures due to its white flowers. Witches and spirits were thought to live within the elder. This is why it bled red sap when cut. Before felling an elder, the following formula was recited. Lady Elhorn, give me of thy wood, and I will give thee of mine when I became a tree. Hmm. Interesting. Its uses are worn. If worn, elders ward off attackers of every kind, hung over doorways and windows. It keeps an evil from the house. It also has the power to force an evil magician to release any enchantments or spells they may have cast against you. So you can... Oh, the, the berries when carried protect against evil or negativity. Grown in the garden, Elder protects the household against the ravages of sor sorceries and shields it from lightning. So you can see that uh, even in your magical, more magical perspective, a lot of your uses are going to line up. And that's the way things should work out. There should never be a real disparity. Um, and you're going to find out when we start going into the actual plants and mixing and matching that there's other things that uh, mix and match also that really just make sense in the end, such as the shapes and colors and whatnot and the effects and how that affects the body. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our plant material, whatever you chose for your particular use and again I chose elderberry throw her in 
throw it in the old grinder. And we're going to want to grind this up really, really fine. So again, a really good grinder. Because in the next step of this, what we're going to be doing is putting alcohol in it, which is going to extract the oil or spirit from the, from the body of the plant. Well, if it's held together in a mass, that makes that much harder to get that release. So, and you're going to find this in a lot of steps. We're trying to break in alchemy always is breaking things down to their singular components and then taking what you want back out and putting that together. That's what you're finding useful and good. So let's go ahead and grind this up. should do it I know that the last thing uh, that I put in there was a little bit of cannabis which isn't gonna hurt my mixture none otherwise I would have cleaned that all out with the cleaning alcohol so now we've got a nice fine mixture to pour in here rather than little hard berries that we're gonna be real hard to extract from <coughs> And then, again, we're going to go over the uh, alcohol thing again quick. <clears throat> I've got food grade 99% alcohol here. When you're looking at the purity, the purity is your uh, volatility level. And that's where it's looking to bond with something else. Because it's not a stable molecule. Well... <clears throat> Every bit of impurity that's in that, so if it's only 40% pure, that 60% cannot bond, is not available to bond with other things. So it's not going to pull out of your mixture the way you want it to. But you absolutely want to make sure that it's food grade, and because it's obviously you're going to be ingesting this in this mixture. Maybe what you're doing is going to be on, in a lotion that you're using topically or maybe you're doing it magically. But either way, you want it to be as absolutely pure as possible because any impurities that you do not, that are in this, are going to be left in your mixture. So all we're going to do is fill the jar up. You see I had about half a jar of... Uh, material. I'm going to fill the jar up with alcohol almost to the top, leaving a little bit of room so I can give it a shake and actually get the material to move around nicely. Seal it up in the mason jar. Give it a little shake so the alcohol completely mixes with the material body. And you're going to want to keep this in a nice in a nice dark place because the sun will degrade the oil. The crystal body that we're going to be finding after we break this down, that's near indestructible. It, it pretty much can't change. Uh, and you're going to find that out because one of the things that you're going to do is put that through such rigor and such fire that it's going to eventually go to a, to a, a state that it doesn't change anymore. It's going to be in a purified crystal state. So the thing that can degrade is the spirit, the oil. And the oil you're going to want to keep away from sunlight, which is going to degrade it. And you're also going to want to keep it away from heat as much as possible. He always degrades the spirit. So, we're going to shake that up. Put that in a nice, cool, dark spot. And we're going to let that sit for the next 40 days. I know that that seems a little bit ridiculous, but in alchemy, 40 days is what it takes to complete a work properly. 
Now you're going to find that part of that is because sometimes your materials are harder to extract the oils from. Well, 40 days is a rule that that will always make it complete. And when it comes down to when we move on to metals and such, 40 it takes that long for it to be broken down into its monoatomic components. So there's not really any skip in this and you really as we're teaching our body the steps just like muscle memory you want to do things the right way and when you do them the right way like that that's the way things get remembered and that's the way it's going to work out when it, your body falls back on it's doing it think it's thinking so let's talk about what happened there what we started out with was whole berries and you can take and appreciate that berry or take a flower like a dandelion which has many medicinal properties and you look at this flower as a whole this is a dandelion and it's a beautiful thing but what is it really useful for that beauty is only a aesthetic visual thing so as an alchemist we break everything down we don't want to just look at it we want to get to the core break it down to its monoatomic components and then extract those out and see what's good because no matter how beautiful it is aesthetically that does not mean it's beautiful altogether and that's what an alchemist is going to do is break it down and find its core essence and pull that back out so once we break and grind the flower up whether it's a dandelion or the elderberries we went from this beautiful usually fairly symmetrical thing to just a pile of ground up mush the elderberries there just look like let's go ahead and break them out there it's just like a pile of purplish reddish black crap just floating in the bottom there and if depending on what type of plant material you're using obviously the color but most plants it's just going to be a green pulpy mass well everything that was there that was a dandelion let's take that because it's a fairly easy to appreciate the beauty of a dandelion everything that was there is still there it's just been arranged differently so this is one of the first steps that we can take in understanding that what we see is not all that important it is something to be to be appreciated but that's not true what the true nature of something is now when we take our lives gnostically and this is where you want to take everything as an alchemist everything you want to move on multiple different levels so when you read any of these books like the suggested Kabbalion, you'll notice that it has it says something but it'll apply on multiple levels that's the as above so below rule and you use start using that in your thinking so you're going to notice that these things that you're doing in alchemy you apply to your life so alchemically when you're applying that to your life you take your life as a whole and you look at it and you start breaking it down into its individual pieces like my story when I was in prison in the first episode where I kept going back through my life again and again and each time I had slightly different results and I would broken it down differently and pulled out and ex extracted it differently until it was just broken down into a, its complete thing and at the end of that I took out what I wanted that's what you're this is the stage that we're talking about where you take in the shine off of it you, you you don't care about the way that it looks don't worry about the shine and society is so busy today trying to spit shine every turd that this is almost counterintuitive at this point you know don't you you're supposed to appreciate everything for what it is and and things like that and they're so busy polishing turds that they they can't ever find anything good and useful 
And this is why society is pushing to a place where things are becoming, they are becoming less capable. We're trying to reverse the order on that. So we're going to go ahead and start breaking things down, no matter how beautiful they are, and, it, and getting down to their core essence and extracting out the things that really were beautiful about that. <laughs> now, that's always easier to do with a life lesson you didn't particularly like because it's easier to start breaking that down and looking at it individually because you didn't really enjoy the whole. So it's much easier to chuck that thing in the grinder. You didn't really appreciate the old, the aesthetics of it, the overall feel of it. So you start looking for those. Where it really gets much harder in life is where you start taking things that you enjoyed also and throwing those in the grinder. Because all those things, all those things that you just enjoyed the way that it felt here, that's the ego part of it. <coughs> and you're going to learn that as we break things down, that all plant materials, carbon and water is the ego. That's the earth components. The thing that is still the plant is are those two pieces of crystal, the liquid crystal and the soluble crystal. That's what you're going to keep and you're that's going to be elderberry extract or or whatever plant you choose and the thing you eject is now going to be carbon or ash so this wasn't ever really the plant to begin with this was of the earth this was just an aesthetic it wasn't of the true thing and whether it's a beautiful plant or an ugly one, depending on your own personal opinions. And this is where truth starts becoming subjective. Not that actual truth and actual laws are subjective, but the way you feel about it. So no matter which way you see that, it still needs to be broken down into its core usefulness. As a person, that's going to take a long time as you go through the things in your life. And that's why Gnostically they speak about 40 years often. Now with a plant, a plant's obviously a, a much less complex thing. So a plant, this is why the 40 days, to completely break everything down so you can put it back together and see each component piece for what it is with a person that's you're looking at 40 years and we're going to find out later when you look into some of the histories and some of the texts as conquering societies engulf other societies you're looking at 400 years in order to get them to turn their society unless you're talking about just a total destruction and obliteration but if you're actually trying to pull that society in and make it part of yours that you're looking at 400 years <clears throat> everything in life should match up like that just like with your seasons that we spoke about earlier and you want to start learning how all these kind of things work so that way what you're doing is is you're putting a boat in the water whenever you're doing something and when you're doing that you want to go with the current not against it so while a lot of these things you'll find that you could do them at other times or do them in other ways it's certainly much easier to go with the current and that way things just carry you along so 40 years is what you're looking at for this Gnostic magnum opus breakdown of yourself and the 40 day practice of doing it with a plant is what shows you over and over again in your everyday life how this works and what your end results are going to be and that's where you get true faith from 
faith isn't just blindly believing something is going to happen because you want it to. Faith is me throwing an apple out the window and believing that it's going to hit the ground because that's how it works. I know that's how it works. I don't need to actually see that proved. I don't even need to get offended if somebody else tells me that, no, that thing will float up. I'm not going to get angry because I'm so rooted in what I believe and what I know. My knowledge and my wisdom have merged fully. There's no shaking me in this. So this is why you start practicing these things every day and then applying them to your life every day on all levels. Then, as in muscle memory, when the things come up that you're, where the time is very stressful, you just jump right into this. This is now the way you do it. And that's the way humans were meant to work. We weren't meant to be these locusts that go through and destroy the earth and try and subjugate everything to our will and break it. There, There's a beauty in understanding what's good in something and, and letting it be that. Also understanding that you might not necessarily like it on a whole. This is where in North Histories, we start looking at Loki and the lessons that that taught us. While Loki was uh, irritant when he was at home, many of the battles that they had and many of the more extreme challenges that they faced, they had to turn to Loki and because of his cunning and the way he saw things differently, they were able to do things and overcome things that they weren't able to do in the ways that they did things every day. Loki was chaos, Thor was stability. Thor was who they called on every day and Thor went and did the Thor thing. And that's what worked 99% of the time. And then sometimes you need a new idea, you need some chaos. And that's when they would call in Loki. Where this applies to what we were just talking about is, is that Loki was, again, irritating in a normal everyday setting. Well, if they as a society had decided that they saw the good that he did and understood that they really did need that and appreciated him for, and appreciated him for that, rather than rejecting him on a whole, it wouldn't have started this entire animosity, which eventually led to the fall of the gods where Loki and his kin went against the Asir. <clears throat> In life, we start looking at everything and breaking it down good and bad, whether you feel good about it or you feel bad about it. And understanding that there's a core useful essence that that thing is and you should appreciate it for that rather than the, what you're seeing and feeling which is the more egoic part of the world that's where you're starting to look like in the matrix where the scene where uh, he goes up and asks and talks to him about looking at all the scrolling numbers on the screen and the guy's like I don't know I just see redhead blonde brunette tall short this is the way an alchemist is supposed to train themselves to look at things only in reverse rather than looking at the code and turning that into a person we look at whatever the person or plant is and start looking to its core, breaking it down and looking for the core useful essence. That way we can extract the gold, the useful, valuable thing, rather than the lead, the not valuable thing. With that, I see that it's time to take a station ID break, give everybody a chance to catch up on their experiment and think about everything that was said. 
Odin's Alchemy is brought to you by thecauldron.net, music to feed your soul. Your favorite place to find top pagan artists and other resources such as Fringe TV and the, and the Witch's Brew magazine.
Welcome back. Let's go over what exactly we've done today so far. We've taken our plant material, whatever it may be, we've ground it and broke it down completely, then put it in our mason jar and mixed it with a volatile substance. What we're trying to accomplish with that volatile substance that we mixed it with is to get the masculine and the feminine of this whole plant to separate. This is where you start understanding things like masculine and feminine. While a person may be masculine and feminine overall, everybody has components of masculine and feminine in them. Everything in the universe has components of masculine and feminine. So we're trying to break down and separate those things out and purify them. On a esoteric level, and you're going to find this in all theologies, uh, these things, the story does apply. In heathen history, the way this story starts out is we start out with the Gyunga Gap. And this doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but this was what the All Mother would be. This is the void, the negative, the pull. We don't understand that part completely. And so, and we aren't in that. That is something that is actually separate from us. But what that did do was the All Father being the masculine in that macro verse, the All Father had at that point in time two separate components. The fire world, or Muspelheim, and the ice world, or Niflheim. These two were completely separate. What happened at this point was the Gyunga Gap the yawning chasm, the void, the black hole, it pulled the pieces of these together. And as it was going along, first pieces broke off and left a more ice side where we have three worlds that are more ice and then three worlds that are more fire and where the two make the Vesca Pisces, the Union, we have Midgard. And that's where we live. So, when it started out, we have to break this down now to the, make the material side our macroverse. So now, the fire side of things is your chaos. And that's going to be your feminine that's going to change all your newer ideas. It's going to pull. Your masculine is going to be your ice side. So when you're breaking this down into alchemy terms, now you had a whole plant rather than in the universe and all father, you have a plant, in my case, elderberry. You grind it down we're reversing this process and getting back to where things started. You grind it down, you pull the two apart. Now you have a masculine and feminine. Now, <clears throat> with Midgard, that's where the two are just completely mixed. And that is a special place that also anything that comes together there on that earth mixes with it. So, First, we're going to separate out that feminine, and the feminine pulls out fairly easily. 
after that, we're going to have to, again, break down the masculine because the carbon or earth is bonded to that masculine. So we're going to have to put that side through the fire. The feminine side, you want to keep away from heat as much as possible. The feminine side is capable of spoiling and souring. The masculine side is not. The crystals are going to remain salt crystals, period. The feminine side will. But, again, this side is bonded with that carbon earth, and now we, we will have to further separate that. But for now, we're, what we're working on is just getting the masculine and the feminine separated and understanding the masculine and fem feminine principles. When we go through the Kabbalion in, the, in an upcoming episode, all of that will get explained. The entire reason that I start out with the actual body process is when you go to read any of these mystical books... Most of what they say, especially if you don't have any experience in this at all, does not make a whole lot of sense. And even if you're intelligent and you're capable of conceptualizing it, you're really not sure. It's the very same concept as if I, was, if I were to go out and read every book on rebuilding engines in the world. And then went and tried to rebuild an engine. It does not work out. This is why anybody that's in a trade or any field, the guys that come right out of college, they say don't know anything and are not very good at their jobs. What were they teaching them in college? Were they teaching them incorrectly? Maybe, maybe not. When you cannot couple wisdom with knowledge, you don't really understand the way it works. And I believe most people are putting the cart in front of the horse. If you actually go and start doing the work, when the philosophy of the work comes with it, you go, oh, I saw that happen. That's why that philosophy makes sense. And then you're able to further implement those things in your life. When you do it in the reverse, you have no reason to believe any particular philosophy. And any philosophy could be equal. An idea unweighed is completely equal. I could go through a recipe book and I have not tasted a single one of those recipes. They are all equally good. It's only after I go get the material bring them up and manifest them, taste them, am I able to determine whether they're good or not at that point in time? So alchemy is where philosophy meets the road. And you actually get to start proving out some of these things, whether it's in your mystical texts, whether it's in your science, whether it's in Gnosticism. All of these ideas start actually becoming real, and that's when you start implementing them in the rest of your life. And that is the goal here on Odin's Alchemy, is to start making things real for people and making it so they can actually implement them. When you start out with something so simple as just hanging out with Grandpa and helping him do the work, you find that when you get to the school, all they are adding is names to what you've been doing. And you already understand how it works. And just like I spoke of with the apple, this gives you a root, a ground. That's the opposite of an idea. You've done this with your body. This is how you absolutely know. And you can't be fooled anymore. You're rooted like a, like a large tree. If the tree does not have a good root system, it sways back and forth, and it's very fragile. And actually, this is part of why you, you prune fruit trees. The top can outgrow the root structure, which is metaphorically in a person. You've taken in all the knowledge, but you've not actually implemented any of that into your life. <coughs> 
and made use of it and truly understood it. So all that knowledge, it truly could be fictional and it may as well have been fictional. If you're spending your time reading these great works that applied to people's lives, then you need to apply them to life. That's what they were meant for. And that's why all of these people had alchemist right at the beginning of their resume. Because alchemy is where all of these great, these higher ideas start breaking down in, to their simplest forms. And then from there, you're able to expand back out and understand a much greater universe. As far as the actual work goes, please understand that I've put together the simplest, cheapest package that I could put think of. So that way anybody at any level could start doing the work. Because that's where you start actually gaining understanding from. I like to refer to this as Shade Tree Alchemy. And that simply was, back in the day, you could either take your car to a shop or you could get somebody to come over to your yard and do it under the shade of a tree. And he didn't have all the tools of a shop, of a shop so he would use what he had around and be very creative with it. Um, I understand there are definitely different ways. And a lot of you are going to have used steam distilling and or just heat press distilling which doesn't include any type of a solvent whatsoever um the reason that i do not recommend that to start is again the oil is subject to souring that can degrade the salt side is not you're going to be able to beat that up heat it with fire you're purposely going to have to heat that with fire just to get it to form up and separate so that one's not but your your feminine side your liquid that one is subject to contamination i don't like putting that heat to it um and to do it really properly and extract a substantial amount, you would need a, a pretty good setup. I understand some people do it with a little bit of a parchment paper and a flat iron or a hair iron and do things like that. But again, you're just horribly damaging the, the etheric fluid that is coming out. And when you're doing that, most people, when they do that also, are never putting in the salts. So, we're going to learn about these other methods. And we're also going to learn about things like after our initial process, you can also, there's also distilling that can happen in between. And a distilling that can happen afterwards, where after the, after the, <clears throat> feminine and the masculine have bonded together you distill that entire thing again to make sure any other impurities are back out of it and pull it down and put it through another process and that also tells you that the masculine and feminine have bonded back together now the carbon never will bond in that again correctly the masculine and feminine crystals will so what other whatever plant material you started out with in my case elderberry then those two crystal sets the masculine and feminine those truly are elderberry and the carbon and such and the water those were earth things those were things from that crystal set being on this earth and forming up around it. The carbon give back to the earth. What's going to happen when you give the carbon back to the earth? Well, now we realize that that carbon had to be put into there for the plant 
So the plant is going to pull that carbon from the ground to make a new plant. That can bring up an entire new set of subjects when you start getting into understanding of that and get into the understanding of permaculture where you understand that black soil comes from carbon in the soil which the life which the plant is using for components to build life and uh it's a bunch of the things that we're doing, such as tearing up the soil every year and monoculture and tearing down all the trees and the hemp plants has depleted our soil of any carbon and it's all up in the air. And everybody's making out like this is such a huge thing, but we can put that carbon back into the soil and let the plants use it as building blocks again like what it was meant. So completely could be a an completely entire different show and belongs more with perm permaculture. But nonetheless, you're just going to take that ash or carbon and put that back out into the soil and let the earth reuse it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a little section that uh, includes tips and tricks for helping make your life better, cheaper, make you start becoming more self-sufficient. We're going to go ahead and start out with a really big one. Even though the concept is really easy, um, this one saved just a ton of power. But power consumption is obviously one going to be one of your biggest issues. Even if you move over to solar power, it does not have near the punch if you wanted to use power like people in the city do, you would need a bank of panels that is going to cost a fortune. If you want to be self-sufficient, you need to start dropping your consumption down and changing the way you live slightly. One of the biggest consumers in your house of power is the refrigerator. Now, especially today, they're starting to make fridges cheaper and cheaper, not cheaper in price, but more cheaply made. Um, this is due to something called planned obsolescence. And we could talk about that at some other point in time. But they're making them so you have to buy a new one every five years is the basic gist of it. Um, but the fridge, the bigger deal is, is that we've moved to a stand-up style storage. Now, one of the basic principles you're going to find is speed is what creates in gases, whether they rise or fall. So hot air rises and cold air sinks and starts moving back toward its liquid state. <clears throat> Every time you open up your refrigerator door, every bit of cold air that has accumulated falls out the front of that refrigerator. And on a very hot day, like we experience in California, when it's 117 degrees out and you open up that fridge, it's a wonderful feeling, but the thing is now your fridge has to kick on again and refill itself with a cold air. And every time it does that, it's taking up its coolant, it's uh, taking up a lot of power. So the deep freeze is your good answer. Now a deep freeze, the thermostats inside those are not set up for refrigerator temperature range. In a deep freeze it doesn't start really kicking in and it doesn't let it get above freezing. Now, the only thing that is different in that format is the actual thermostat. So you're not going to hurt it at all at changing that out and bypassing it into a way where it will kick on, where it will let it get to a warmer temperature before it kicks on and then shuts off at a warmer temperature. You just need to put that thermostat system in there. Once it's in there, your box type cooler or a freezer the air is trapped down in the box and when you open up the lid 
that cold air stays in the box. And during those hot times, again, you can see it, a little poof, like almost mushroom head comes up and out. But it doesn't start dumping out the same as if you open up the freezer side of a stand-up fridge. To resolve that problem, this one was called the kegerator. It's made by Johnson Controls. So all this is, is a really simple contraption. You plug your freezer plug into this, and then this into your power source. And then you run this little probe into the freezer and set your temperature on the dial. And then it will start letting the power pass through. It just completely bypasses your freezer's thermostat. And you just turn that all the way wide open. It bypasses that system and allows your, your deep freeze to become a fridge. This is going to save you a ton of power. Um, deep freeze, if I remember correctly, are like eight times more insulated than a fridge. And the compressor and coil setup is much thicker and denser. So this is something that makes it so it runs more efficiently. It holds the heat or the cool, the cold air better. It's an entirely better setup. And all you're going to have to do is is get like little plastic baskets or whatever and set yourself up with a little arrangement setup so that way you can reach in there and easily access things. But doing this was about point on my uh, make controller on my solar setup. It shows how many kilowatt how many kilowatt hours of power I'm pulling per hour. And it dropped down. I was running about 0.6 during the summer and it dropped me down to in bouncing in between 0.3 and 0.2 which we were obviously our consumption was severely low at the time anyways to make it jump like that because when we started out moving out here and first started truly watching our power because we lived off grid we were pulling over 2.2 kilowatts per hour and now we've got that down to where we live most of most of the time off of about 0.2. But that's all little learning lessons and little things like this that changed all of that and made it so we can comfortably live the life that we want without giving up everything like refrigerated foods. So we're going to try and include a little something like that in most every week. And sometimes it's going to be entire episodes that are about doing something off-grid or something like that in your life. And hopefully we can all start taking a step forward into changing our lives and taking our own power back to ourselves and not being so dependent on everything else. I hope everyone had fun today. I understand that the project itself is going to be a little bit slow going at first, but there is so much that uh, you have to start compacting together and weaving together in a symphony so one step at a time in its order and while you're actually doing the experiment you're supposed to be thinking about these things and putting that intention into what you're doing understanding that as i put the volatile substance into the plant matter that i intended on pulling the feminine as much of the feminine oil as i can and separating the masculine and feminine and then also applying that to your life so as we move on to future episodes where we start doing more and more things everything will start tying together more heavily and we can start tying in the more esoteric and gnostic works and start making it apply to other things in your life we're also going to be doing little things like learning how to live off-grid, uh, 
starting from simple things like water filtration uh, all the way up to solar power and wind power things like that everything that you're doing should apply to all areas of your life that's the beauty of it and we're gonna try and tie all that together